Well, welcome back to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back. I was here this afternoon with two incredible couples that returned on Tea Time. And tonight I have Sean Bridges in the house and we're gonna talk thriller. We're gonna talk uh, screenwriting. And his tea tonight is totally excited and attitude. That's the type of tea we're going to be serving tonight with all of you guys. But before we get started on all of that, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. We're going to get you to ring that little doorbell so you can get notified when these tea times are live. And you can join the live stream with your questions, comments, and support and all that good stuff. Uh, if any of the tea times resonate with you, I do encourage you to share them with your friends, family, co-workers, all of that. You can listen to them in the morning, afternoon, in the evening on the road, in your home, at a picnic, at an event, if you're bored, but no, don't tell anybody I told you that. Um, and again, I wanna thank all of my supporters because I could not do this without all of you guys. So let's get the disclaimer, let's get some bio, and let's get some tea serving with Sean Bridges tonight. And we're gonna talk about his new book called The Gun Barrel Highway. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forth in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and it's not a panelist discussion. You may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at book tonight show in any aspect. I myself, Miss Liz and we'll see you at a later show at a later time. And again, all tea time shows are done on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, my guest is in Germany. It's Nickel Award winning screenwriter and author. He's the Stephen King Dollar Baby with his festival winning audio productions of One for the World. His Audible Parade productions created a serial, serial, serial at work on their next horror suspense audio series, Parasites Zero. His screenplay beginner slot is a 20 winner. He produced and directed two documentaries in the Caribbean, one in Jamaica for teachers and students in 20. He's worked on a number of projects for Troublemaker Studios out of Austin, Texas. Welcome, is Welcome Sean. Right. In Germany? Oh, it's uh, Wiesbaden. Wiesbaden, Germany. Yeah, I was Wiesbaden. born there. I, I went to college in Heidelberg and Munich. So I spent, um, my father was in the military, so I grew up um, kind of moving around every three years, like an internal alarm clock, um, and then finally settled in, in Texas for in 1999. But yeah, I was born in Wiesbaden, Germany and went to school there. So Okay, so let's take you back to that Germany. Who were you as a little boy and who are you now, Sean? I was a, I still am a kid, to be honest with you. I was a little kid who uh, was always the new kid, always. Like it always seem, seemed like every time we moved, we never moved down the street. We always moved to a different state or continent. So it was always a, um, and not to date myself, but this was pre-cell phone and pre-internet kind of time. So when you moved, it was really, you know, you were erasing the chalkboard and starting over from scratch. Um, 
I, in a way, always found that to be, you know, I, I always felt different. It took me a while to find a place where I didn't feel like I was outside the fishbowl, but I loved that experience getting to connect with new cultures and new people and, and um, uh, having to learn to kind of fit in instead of fading in the background and, and trying to connect with new people all the time. And honestly, I still find myself doing that, even as an adult. Um, you know, I've never I've heard that saying before. Oh, oh you're freezing. So, up. are you are you are you back? No, oh, I'm here. Yeah, I was. I could see me. I just all of a sudden you locked up, and I was like, oh, I wonder what's going on. So. <laughs> Those little warm host technology, right? The good old yeah, that's going <laughs> live, right? Live is. Uh, the blooper season, right? We have a little bit. Well, of life is fun, yeah. So, Sean, I've never heard that saying before. That out of the fishbowl. So uh, I think it was just you know you're you're coming into a new environment with new people. You're not sure um, if you fit there, and I felt like since I never the question that takes me an hour to answer because I don't know where I'm from, and I'm I was. Born again moved again so um I just it, it took me a while to feel lost in texas when i moved there in 99 it felt like home to me it was very I just felt like uh this really isn't for me or i'm not really you know i it was easy that makes sense and it was easy to kind of when it was Time to move, whether it was it's three years up, you're done. Uh, I would pack up and go somewhere else and try something else. I <laughs> see. <laughs> it seems not on the cheap, maybe. I mean, I would say for any kind of vibe. <laughs> okay, I've just seen all these school, which was fun. Students from everywhere, and I love that experience with connecting with everybody and meeting people from cultures and countries that I would have never imagined going to. And it was always amazing to me. So I've always been that we we didn't live on the military base. We lived. Uh, my German is is not too bad. I haven't used it for years, but when I actually have a beer or two, it comes back. It's in my head somewhere. Um, yeah, funny. <laughs> but, it's in there when it comes out when it needs. Yeah, yeah it's and or if I'm talking to somebody, it's it's. Um, I always was fascinated with people who spoke many languages. I'm like, how do you do those things that adults or how? You say that the right way, the right, they just impulsively will say it, and, and you know, that's I, anybody that I've known that speaks five or more languages, it blows my mind. Yeah, I wouldn't, I love that experience. So, just connecting with other people, other cultures, and, and meeting people from all over, honestly, it was great. I love that you just spoke in German because my mom was a little kid that gave me my first cup of tea, and she was from Germany, and uh, she taught me how to serve. That language. Oh, I, my my German suck. I I say Oh, we're getting locked up again. What is going on? That's now. bad. But we used to talk a lot of German. Uh, <laughs> it froze again. <laughs> Aww. I don't know why it's freezing. I hope you come back. I hope she comes back. Oop, it went out.
Hey, I lost you all of a sudden. Everyone can see and hear me. Hi, everyone. I can't see. They're, I'm back out again. <laughs> Aw. Are you there, Sean? I'm here. Yeah, I can hear you. You know, I every time I have a good tea time going on, guys. <laughs> oh, that was fun though. All of a sudden it froze. I was like, oh, okay, she's dripped there. And then you clicked out, and that's fine though. It's fine. <laughs> that's a good old live live show, right? And we, we're gonna perfect. have some bloopers, right? So yeah, Sean, technical before, are not a problem. Right. Before the wormhole comes back and gets Miss Liz again, let's get <laughs> let's get into the book. I want to get into your book, but I want to get into the understanding of what got you into the thriller genre. Uh, I started writing seriously as a screenwriter and I liked thrillers, but I tend to jump genres to just see what I was comfortable with. And my father's a painter. I can't draw anything. So I think I draw with words. And uh, it was something that I learned on my own. I didn't go to, I went to college for an international business and marketing degree. So I probably should be a banker, but I went a different direction in life. And um, that's where I won the, the nickel award, which was sponsored by basically the Academy Awards Um uh, I beat out thousands of other people to, to go there. I was invited. I had uh, Los Angeles representation and then tried to work as a screenwriter and, and wrote a number of maybe about a dozen dozen screenplays in different genres. But the suspense thriller genre is always like a comfortable sweater. And uh, I tried to write my first novel in 2010 and it was successful, but I ended up self-publishing it. Uh, Gun Barrel Highway is my fourth book that I've written, but it's my first professionally published novel. So I connected with a publisher out of New York and they picked it up. That was a whole process in itself of going through the editing process, uh, finding them, pitching it to them, having them decide they wanted to take me on under contract, then working with me on editing it, uh, then getting to the point where it's going to be released on November 20th. But um it was an idea. Honestly, it was going to be a screenplay years ago that I just never, never figured out. It was a, a short. I had a good beginning, but I didn't know where to go with it. And I just threw it in a drawer. And then years later, I found that and reread what I had, salvaged a few pieces of it and decided, oh, this might make an interesting book and uh, based it on where I'm living in central Texas. And um, yeah, it, it, it was it, it's become my first professionally published novel now. So it's just weird where things end up going sometimes. So how did you get the name Gun Barrel? Gun Barrel Highway, it, it was it, initially this was called Hit and Run, which I thought was too generic and just sounded flat. And Gun Barrel Highway, it was a song from Midnight Oil, which was a group in the 80s. Again, showing my my uh, my uh, <laughs> age. Your age. <laughs> but it was an album that uh, called Diesel and Dust that I liked in high school. And it was a it was like a, a deep cut track. I don't even think it was on. But anyway, <laughs> I that title, I remember jumping out at me and thinking that's a great title uh, because it's basically a guy who's on the run and people are trying to whether it's police officers or vigilantes everybody's trying to get this guy and i thought uh that's a great title come to find out there really is a gun barrel highway in australia it's a flat 14 or 1500 mile road that just goes out in the middle of, in the northwest territory so uh it makes me like Oh, that would be a bucket list, amazing life trip to go drive that road, something out of Mad Max probably, but that would be amazing to go do. Um, but yeah, I just, I just thought that title was great, honestly. So sometimes um, titles take a while to, to, to materialize. And this one, when I, when I stumbled upon that, I thought that's the title. That's what this is. This guy's in a gun barrel highway. There's your number three trip. Yeah, I know. That's in the gonna, backstage, right? The it's in line. Yeah, I would. I would love to. Go. I've never been to that part of the world. I would love to go. But that was that was the inspiration for the title, where all that came from. I think that would be really cool if you went to Australia. Yeah, so I would love to. I it would. It's always been a place I've envisioned and and thought about, and um, will end up there. Will go some sometime, not for just a couple of days, but go for an extended period of time and just experience it the way you should you know that would be amazing yeah you're gonna get off this tea time you're gonna get your crew together and we're gonna be we're going to australia <laughs> Down there, yeah. But the funny thing is uh texas and australians seem to connect because i think the the wildlife and the 
the weather and the climate all seem to kind of match up. So Australians love Texas and Texans love Australians. I, I, I don't, I didn't, I don't know why that is, but that's something I've, I've heard. So I can imagine that the, I mean, everything's out to hurt you, all kinds of, uh, you know, every plant and wildlife seems to be scary. So it's, it kind of fits that mindset. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much what Texas is right now. So. Well, and it would make a good thriller, right? It would. Yeah. I would love to go. Uh, so it, it's one of those that it's definitely on my list of mental, you know, I have a mental checklist of things that I've got to get to eventually. And it's, it's in there. Yeah. I'd love to go. So I want to talk about these Stephen King short stories. Cause I sure. found you on, I, I found you on there. So tell us a little bit about that. I, uh, I heard about the dollar baby program when I was a kid in high school, again, dating myself. I remember seeing on VHS, you know, <laughs> so I keep going back to all these VHS. Uh, you're giving yourself VHS really away. <laughs> but, uh, I watched it as a kid and, um, uh, Frank Darabont, who directed uh, Shawshank Redemption and The Mist, was a dollar baby. And they released some, basically what it is, is uh, Stephen King will license his short stories to people for a dollar. And that, you you know, for the rights to use and do anything you want with that story. And um, I had heard about this program, but had you know no idea how to apply. And decades go by. And I stumbled upon an article that kind of led to where you would actually apply to his, him in Maine to become a dollar baby. And I thought, I, uh, you know, then they weren't accepting applications, I guess. And, and I tagged it through the rest of the year. And then at the beginning of this would have been 2020, right before COVID, um, I applied out of the blue thinking there's no way I'm going to, going to get picked. And they even said, don't expect to hear anything for another six months. And I thought, yeah. Um, and then that week they reached out to me and said, we would like to, to, offer you, we'd like to bring you into the program. And I felt like I won a golden ticket, basically. I couldn't believe it. And um, I picked one for the road, which was kind of a, a sequel to a, a story he wrote called Salem's Lot, which is a famous kind of vampires in a small town kind of uh, book that he wrote in the 70s. And it was in a, it was in the, the, uh, the book Night Shift, which was important to me because my father gave me that it was one of the first Stephen King books I read. My dad gave it to me when I was a kid. And so I got to put him in the production as a guy ordering a drink at the bar in uh, Tukey's bar. And it just, I thought that brought it full circle to have my dad part of the program when he was the one that introduced me to this book. But we ended up doing it as an audio drama, a uh, 40 minute audio drama. This was during COVID. So we had to take all sorts of precautions to do it, but it was super fun. And we were the first licensed audio production, uh, the first dollar baby that was allowed to do it that way. So um, that was a neat experience too. And uh, then I took it on the festival circuit. It won a number of awards around the world, honestly. Um, it placed maybe about a dozen dozen film festivals and audio festivals. And um, it's out there. It, it's, it's still one of my proudest things. I think taking his short story and turning it into an audio drama, which in in itself is strange. It's like writing for the blind. You're writing something for people to, you know, hear audibly to be able to understand the story without a narrator or anybody telling you the story. So the actors and the sound effects and the music all have to be able to explain what's going on. Um, so taking that story and breaking it down to make it work is still one of the best things I've ever done as a writer. Um, I just had such a blast doing that. Yeah, it was. It's one of my favorite things I've ever done, honestly. So what got you into screenwriting? It, it was cheap. Uh, it didn't cost a lot. It was just, uh, I learned on the, I learned trial and error. I remember the first time I tried to write a script, I wrote, you know, I didn't, I didn't really even know what I was doing. So it was like, write what you know was a concept I heard about as a kid. And I had, I was working at a hotel in Heidelberg and had a crazy night as a, a hotel clerk working the graveyard shift. And so I used that as inspiration to write my first screenplay. And no parent has an ugly child, but that one hasn't aged well. It was not that great of a script, but it, um, without that script, I wouldn't have gone on to write the other ones and the other ones. So I, it's very important to me, this, this first one I wrote called Waiting for the Donut Man, but it was kind of a clerk's a slacker hybrid. Um, I liked it. it. It was just fun to do. And I learned on the fly how to the structure them, how to, how they look and, um, it was just a desire to, I've always been a film geek. So I think this was kind of my way of, Ooh, let me see if I could take this seriously at all. It was that time in my life where I was, maybe I want to be a pilot. Maybe I want to do this. Maybe I want to do this. And I would try different things to, um, and then this one hit in Austin. I went to Austin film festival. I was moving to Florida for an insurance job. 
Uh, I didn't want to work there, so I was taking my time driving from Virginia to Florida. And um, in route, I found out I had placed in the Austin Film Festival. Flew to Austin for the festival. This would have been 97. Had an amazing time. I felt like I found a connection of people. I spent the whole week at the film festival downtown Austin and said I would move there someday. And two years later, I moved to Austin in 99. So it was um, another catalyst in life that, you know, I just uh, tried something and 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 it worked. It, it was something I enjoyed doing. So I kept going and doing it again and again and again and uh, was able to you know, hit some, get some festival success. And that led to kind of cracking the gates of Hollywood open and was a hip pocketed by CAA and went out for meetings and had a hip, um, optioned a couple scripts. Um, yeah, it was, it was a wild time. So during that time and during that time, Sean, have you met any incredible people? That you oh, sure. Yeah. You meet, you meet different people. You go in different meetings. Um, <laughs> all right. This is, this is my favorite kind of meeting story because, um, you, you, I would go on meetings at production companies. I was still blown. I remember going to James Cameron's production company and I was floored. I was like looking at all the displays and they're trying to take me down for the meeting. And I'm not wanting to like, I'm taking my, like, look at this. Wow. Look at this. And um, honestly, when you go to these places, it's like going to a dentist's office, you go in, you sit down, there's a receptionist. She asks you if you want a drink, you say yes, because you're going to be talking. So I get, you get a bottle of water. Then you go into a room with a number, you know, a few executives and then they, you're either there to talk about a specific script or it's a meet and greet where they've heard about you and they want to find out, you know, you have material going out in the industry. They want to know who you are or you might have something for for a project or a book that they're doing. So I kind of got to run all over Hollywood and do these meetings. I would fly in. I uh, was living in Austin. I would fly in and then go around and do meetings. Uh, I got I got a meeting at Nicholas Cage's company on um Sunset Strip was right across the street from the Hustler store. I remember that. And parking. And I go up the elevator. I go into um, Saturn Films. I think Saturn Films was the, the company. And there was a German Shepherd dog in there. And the reception, and there was one other person who clearly was scared of, to death of dogs. And she was at the far end of the room. And I love dogs. So I kind of went up to the dog and said, hi, buddy. And the dog was responding to me. And I sat down and waited to be called in for the meeting. And I went in and pitched, I guess I, I was pitching, a, I think, a werewolf Western script I wrote called High Moon and a um, medical drama called Pandora's Box that I was thinking of putting together and just different ideas and journeyman, the script that had gotten me there, which was a time travel adventure, like a Twilight Zone. And I left the meeting and the receptionist was like, well, congratulations, you got to read. And I'm like, yeah, they seem interested in, in the material. She's like, no, no, you got to read before you even walked in there. And I was like, well, how did that happen? And she's like, oh, Nick's dog liked you. And if the dog liked you, they, you got to read. And I thought, well, that's brilliant. So I, I didn't even realize that was a thing, but it seemed very, nothing came of it other than that story, but it was really a cool meeting. Um, and I got a bunch of those, yeah, different types of production company meetings and what that whole experience is like. And uh, yeah, it's why it was wild. That was a good, good time to get out there and just go and, and pitch. And, you know, I've had scripts that have materialized from pitches in the room where they responded to them. And I went and, and wrote it and wrote drafts and then turned material in. So you were always kind of writing, always hustling, always kind of pitching projects and moving. Well, I'm glad that you put that out there because a lot of people think like, oh, you just write a script and boom, it's a movie, right? <laughs> oh, I remember meeting a woman who wrote a, she was, said she wrote a draft so she could buy a house. And I, I guarantee she's got to still be renting. It's just, it's one of these, like, it's a marathon. You write and you rewrite and you edit and you change and nothing's ever done. I think the best, like when is when is a screenplay finished when you just can't stand it anymore? I always thought that was the best writing advice. It's like you just you've messed with it so much you can't you don't you're done with it. And I have a couple scripts like that where I'm like I just do not want to want to get back in there again. So it's done as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's definitely a marathon, not a sprint. It's a long term goal. Um, and uh, the festival circuit was how I got in. That's how I got there i got los angeles interest and then just kept writing and and worked with uh, agents and managers and, and went that route yeah when you when you said it was like going to the dentist i was like oh my god that's like a horror for me like i i dentist office is like a place i avoid like it's like a vampire place like you can stay well, away they, was so strange is how because they all had a fish tank or some kind of thing they all had a receptionist and and I, what would happen is at the end of the day i would go to my hotel room and have a stack of water bottles from all the different 
meetings I had. So I would always take a picture of like my seven or eight water bottles stacked up because you would always kind of have to be talking and um, even little tricks like there, you go into a room and there's always a hardback chair in the room. Go to the, go grab the chair and bring it over to the desk because if you sit in the couch, you sink down lower than the desk. And if you're sitting in the chair, it was just, you know, weird little things like that, that um, would help in a way. And, but it really was that kind of pedestrian. It was very, um, you know, I think when people think of Hollywood, they think of the dream factory. I, I focused on the factory aspects of it. It was a job and it, there was a, a way to do it. Um, and the dream was always exciting. And I mean, getting to go on studio lots and, you know, you pull up and the, the guy checks your name and there's like the big Warner brothers tower or something, or it's just amazing to get to do those kind of things. But the studio back lot is pretty bland. It's just some, you know, empty, hang some hangers and bungalows and doesn't really look like anything. So it's kind of wild when you get in there. Well, it, and it's nice to put that out there, you know, because everyone thinks Hollywood, right? Oh, fame, fortune, instant spotlight. It's there's a lot of work that goes behind all of these movies and films and books and all of that, right? Yeah, when you see the credits roll, there's a lot of names and a lot of people involved at all aspects, and and it takes years sometimes. What I've also discovered is um, when you meet people in LA, they t if they, if they were interested in a script. It didn't matter anything else I wrote. That's what they wanted to focus on. And they never let it go. Uh, and they also have no sense of time. So they could talk to you 10 years later. And it's like they spoke to you last week. Like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, I haven't spoke to you since 2001 or something. It's like, yeah, life's been good. This kind of, It's just they, um, it's just, a, it's a different animal. It's a different way of being there. Now, the industry is going through huge changes now, but um, it's still an exciting, anytime, you know, LA is exciting, but it's a lot like Las Vegas to me. Two or three days and I'm done. I got to get out of there. I've had my fill. So I never wanted to live there, but I liked going in and going to meetings and then flying out. Well, it, it seems like it's a busy, busy, like almost going shopping right in the shopping mall. It's so busy, right? It's just go, 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 go. And nothing is centralized. Everything is scattered everywhere. So everywhere you have to go is across town and every town, every, every highway is, is, tra is a traffic jam. So it just takes a while and again, I'll date myself. This is pre cell phones. I was like MapQuest and things like that, just you know, trying to figure out where I was going. And I I get lost going around the block. So it was a wild for, thing for me to do to like, okay, I gotta go to Burbank to Center Studio City. It's like I can do that and I try to figure out my way around. Uh it was wild. Yeah. It was always wild. It sounds like you have a lot of adventure in your life, Derek Sean. I think life should be like that. Uh, it goes up and down, um, but I I like living uh, a fun life. I like taking chances. I have a lot of failure. I'm on a first name basis with failure. We get along fine, uh, but I don't let it beat me. And I'll try different things. And I've had so many, you know, the uh, when one door closes, something else opens. I mean, it's a cliche, but I found that to be true, where if something yeah. ends and I think, well, that's it. There have been plenty of times where... Um, like I was with CAA for a, a few years. I remember I just hit a festival with a new script and my agent said, that's great. We're no longer going to be working with you. And I was like, well, okay. So it was a good six year run. And I thought, well, I'm done. And then a year later, I'm doing a documentary in, in Kingston, Jamaica. And then a year after that, I'm doing a documentary in Port of Spain, Trinidad. And I didn't see that coming at all. And then the books and then trying that, I there was no reason for me to be an author. It was just oh, let me see if I can get work out to an audience this way. Um, the audio dramas was something that came about. I was in a, you know, in a, in a place of like, ah, things aren't going my way. I was asked to be a judge at the Austin Film Festival. And I said, yeah. And it got me a badge for the festival. And I attended some 90 minute panel on, on a whim that was called Audio Theater and discovered it was like, radio dramas from the 50s but using modern technology to distribute Ooh. it to an audience so i love that idea and it was another way to get material out to an audience i'd well, never it, been, it, well, I'd never been to, in a recording it, studio or anything it was just a new way of doing things and i are you know an old way but a neat for me it was neat it was new and i thought this is kind of an it's another way to get material out to an audience let me try that and so i've always been open to trying things well, it's nice to get into different different aspects, right? Different branches and and yeah, avenues I think it makes as well. Life exciting, and and 
honestly, when I was a screenwriter, the only people that were reading my work were either agents or managers or production companies. And that was it. And nobody else was seeing any of these things. And I thought, all this is going to end up in a box that nobody's ever going to see what, you know, so it started making me think, what are other avenues to get material basically out to the public, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, and that's where, let me try to see if I can write a novel and, and learning how to do that. And that's all was a whole experience in self-publishing and then going through the publishing, um, you know, system and everything that you do to get to a professionally published novel is a long-term you know, I wrote Gun Barrel Highway in a year, then it took a year to find a home, then it took a year to go through editing and all the things I had to go through. So when it comes out in November, that's been a three year process to get from me writing the best book I could to literally it coming out on 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 shelves. And um, I would now it's like, okay, that's the only way I would ever write a novel going through the editing, so editing, having editors look at your work is so important and they find things you can't see and it's so worthwhile. And it only makes your work that much better. So I would sing the praises of, of, of editors all day. Um, and I love that. And working on a new audio drama with about 50 voice actors that's coming out next year. Uh, we have so much fun. There's so much talent here in um, Central Texas, whether it's Austin, San Antonio, or the Hill Country, Dallas. I connect with professional actors from stage, screen, movies. You know, it's amazing. Um, Working at a recording studio, I'd never been in one before. Now I work at a recording studio in Blanco, Texas all the time. Um, it, it's just, I think, always opening, always opening myself to new things, trying new things, getting out there. I think it's important. That's that's how I will always, I think, live life. I don't want to live it any other way. Well, I think it's important, right, to have that uh, tri trial and error, you know, and, and it's okay to be good with failure, you know, because then you know that you're being true to yourself. You're being authentic to yourself as well. Well, I tell my nieces and nephews, I, I say, look, you can fail. That's fine. But the worst thing you can do is not try. If you want to yeah. do something and not try, I think that's the kind of thing you you regret forever. And as you get older, you're like, oh, I wish I would have taken that that opportunity. I wish I would have done that. And I don't want to have those. Th I'll, I would rather, you know, well, let's, let's give it a shot. Let's try it. And yeah. that's always been my my mindset. And I don't know if that comes back to just being a new kid and moving around all the time or, or just uh, willing to take risks and chances. Um, even with this new book, I, I work as a bartender right now at a whiskey distillery in central Texas, which is a very Texas thing to do. That feels like a stamp in my Texas passport, actually. But um, I'm investing in myself to get the book out to, to you know, hopefully that people will, will, will respond to the new novel. The early reviews have been really positive and I'm taking a chance on myself. And I think those are the best kind of chances you can take in life is chances on yourself. So. So Sean, what got you into bar and bartending? <laughs> um, my grandfather was a bartender. It was one of those things I enjoyed doing. Uh, I don't go to parties well, so I like to keep busy, if that makes sense. I would go to parties and clean up, or I just like to be like, I go to a party like a NASCAR driver. I go round and round in a circle till I crash and burn or it's over and get out of there. It's just a weird way. I don't, I feel uncomfortable in those situations, but if I'm doing something, I like that so much better. And um, bartending has a craft to it. I like craft cocktails. I like making cocktails and making drinks. There's, there's an art form to it. So again, I think it was one of those things that I, um, I took a class in bartending, uh, last year in Texas and, and practice, you know, it had to be a license. You have to have a license from the uh, TABC liquor authority in Texas to become a bartender. So I, I went and got my training for that and loved it. And it was just one of those, hey, I want to do this. I was doing it at parties and making drinks. And I thought I want to profess, I want to just get some more training on and being able, you know, be able to make other drinks and, and learn more about it. And um, that led me to a, a job this year at, a, at this uh, tasting room in Blanco, which I love. I'm having the best time there. It's hard work, but um, I also enjoy it. I enjoy the patrons. I don't drink. So I drink pineapple juice and orange juice and kind of talk to everybody. And it's fun. So do you have a signature drink? Uh, old fashioned. I love making an old fashioned. It's uh, everybody likes it differently. Some people like it sweeter. Some people like it more whiskey. Some people like more cherry juice. Some people, but yeah, I love making an old fashioned from scratch with about anything is a lot of fun. It's still a, a drink I like to put together and I make a mean rum punch. So that's a good one too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when there's a party, everybody calls you, right? Make the they drink. actually do. Yeah. Uh, anytime we do family parties, I, they give me like, make that, make that rum. It's like a rum punch or, or, um, 
other signature cocktails or I'll make a bat a vat of it, like a batch of it and bring it to the party. And yeah, that's instead of bringing like a, a fruit salad or something, I bring the alcoholic drink. So <laughs> yeah, bring that thing you make, like bring that one. Like, okay, I can do that. That's cool. So Sean, I want to go back to the Stephen King. Have you ever met Stephen King in person? No. And that was probably the one thing that I was hoping would come out of this. I, we, I communicated with his secretary through the whole thing and she was wonderful. His office was wonderful. And I thought that would be the cherry on top, actually getting to hear from him. Um, all I knew was that, you know, we had won festivals with it. Um, I'm very proud of it, but no, I would, I would still love to have that connection. That would have been amazing. But uh, Margaret, uh, his secretary was as close as I got. So and what Stephen King movie changed your life? Shawshank Redemption was probably the big one. It still makes me cry. Uh, I know what's coming and I still cry at the end. Um, uh, his books, uh, The Running, I'm a, I'm a big Richard Bachman guy who was his pseudonym. Uh, I collect Richard Bachman paperbacks because they were put out. He, he wrote under a pseudonym in the 70s and 80s and um, wrote five books until he, it was discovered. So I became a collector for Bachman books, whether they were American publisher or British publisher. And I, I actually, am, I've got six of the eight paperbacks and uh, I've got thin, uh, editions of Thinner, editions of Blaze. I just, I Richard Bachman, his pseudonym, there was something about his books, The Running Man, The Long Walk, that I, road work that I just love. Um, absolutely love those books. I'll reread them all the time just for inspiration. And Elmore Leonard, I'm a big Elmore Leonard fan. Um, He's also another novel and Richard Matheson. Those are novelists that I, I will reread their work a lot just um, to feel that spark that I felt when I first read it. But uh, yeah, if I had to pick a Stephen King book, it would be the running man. It's my favorite book. Oh, nice one. I like that one. And I didn't know that Stephen King did the Shawshank Redemption. I didn't know it was him that did that. It was a short story in different seasons. So it was also with the body or which was stand by me was the movie. And um Oh, I'm blanking on the other one. Uh, oh, uh, At Pupil, which was a great one. Um, but they were kind of novellas, and he had four novellas. The Breathing Method, I guess, was the fourth one. But yeah, he, um, Shawshank Redemption was, was, uh, and then Frank Darabont was a dollar baby, which was amazing. So he got his, uh, he did The Woman in the Room as his dollar baby, which was a short story in Night Shift. So I'd go down the rabbit hole with all this stuff. But um, yeah, it, and that just, that, just to even be in that, group of people that got to, to work with that is an honor in itself. So it would be great to just meet him someday because I'm, I'm such a, I would, I would not fanboy other than my mentally, I'd be losing it mentally, but I would be very calm and collected. <laughs> it's very professional, but I would be like, Oh my God. So like bring an old yeah. fashioned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I can give him a couple of those, but that would be uh it would be amazing. But yeah, I, I just felt honored to even be a dollar baby. That was a big, big accomplishment. But yeah, I'm a huge fan. He taught me to learn to love to read, which I think is probably the best uh, best thing you can say about an author. Well, I seen that when I did my homework on you that uh, he taught you how to read. Yeah, he was he was the first like author I remember buying his books and carrying them around and uh, just really not understanding. I, I think that there's there's an author authors make it look so easy, and that's a master craftsman that can do that. Uh, Joe Lansdale can do this. Uh, um, Elmer Leonard can do this. And they just, when you read their prose, you fall right into their stories. And it really takes an artist to be able to do that. And I'm always amazed at, at how they can consistently, continuously do that over and over and over again. So um, it's, yeah, it looks easy, but I think it, it takes a hell of a lot of work to get to that easy part, you know. Let's get into your tea, Sean. That's why we're sure. here, right? So the tea yeah. that you gave, totally excited and attitude. Why those three words? I was, I was, I remember talking to a friend about this, like, what, what is my tea? What should it be? And uh, this was back right before I won a, won an award in San Antonio, like the weekend, I think I, I won a script award, which was nuts that this year has always has been about rebuilding and um, finding myself again and trying new things. I had a, went through a breakup and, and basically at the beginning of the year, and I've been rebounding from that in a way that I haven't in other years. Uh, for some reason, 55 has become a big transitional year for me. So I think that term kind of sums up my year, the way it's been personally, professionally, creatively, um, the way I feel about life now. Uh, what's, I mean, this book's about to drop. I'm going to go uh, see my godmother in Germany in November. I can't wait to that, see that, see her and see the family there. And, um, 
So this year is still continuously being an exciting year. And I'm just, uh, that's how I feel about, about my life from January on. And I, I knew I'm a big 11 guy. 11s mean something to me. And 55, I thought was going to be a milestone year. I didn't know, you know, I wasn't, ex when the breakup happened and, and thinking I, and realizing I was starting over again, I was like, geez, is this what, you know, I'm doing this again at 55. You gotta be kidding me. Um, but it also made me think, okay, I'm going to not spiral downwards. I'm going to spiral upwards. I'm going to live life and I'm going to find myself again and I'm going to be happy and I'm going to work out and, and just live life in a positive direction. And, and that's what this whole year has been about. And uh, so, yeah, when I came up with that, I thought that's kind of my year. Well, I like the word totally. It's like the <laughs> totally cool dude, right? It's like yeah. the Ninja Turtles, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's it's again feeling like a kid. I I think I feel like a kid always. I still have, you know, Halloween's my favorite time of the year. Um, watching scary movies and and just uh, candy and just being that 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 mindset of that kid that I I still am in a way. So um, I love that. And yeah, totally is a kid's word. And I, that's where I think too that it fit. I like it. My mind I, right now. I've never had totally for a tea. So and that's my first Oh, that's totally good. Tea. So I'm the first so one. That's totally cool, cool like. right? <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into the one one for the road. That was a production that you did, an audio production. How that was that a Stephen King one. Yeah, one for the road. It was, um, I worked with actors. I had worked, I'd done Triple Six. It was my first Audible production. And that was based on a script I wrote. And it became like five five episodes each one was about 30 minutes long and i met an actor on there named kenneth wayne bradley who was in um fear the walking dead he was in troop zero he was in um drive angry with nicholas cage again the nicholas cage connection he was with um he was in the leftovers an hbo show he's just a really talented actor and i remember when i got the, the stephen king project i said hey man uh, the the story is basically two there's two old men in a bar and it's a, a main, a main wind, a storm is hitting, snowstorm is hitting, and they're about to close down for the night. And a guy stumbles in, and he's a tourist whose car broke down on the outskirts of town. And the outskirts of town is Salem's Lot, which is full of vampires. So he's left his wife and child in a running car in the middle of a snowstorm and walked his way to this bar. And these two guys are like, let's go get your your kids, your wife and kid. But understand, there's, you know, they're trying to kind of say, look, there's something out there. If they're not in the car, we're going to leave right away. And it's just this eerie feeling of, oh, something's going on. And, and yeah, Salem's Lot ends with the vampires basically still, still in this town, this community. And um, so I, he was one of the actors that I, I knew I was going to approach for it. And through Ken, Ken Bradley, I'm uh, Ken worked with another actor who's a stage actor out of Austin named Ken Webster, who's an amazing actor. So they became the two kind of principals. And I had worked with another actor named Heath Allen, who's like a Tasmanian devil at the mic. Like he's a very mild mannered guy, but you put him at the mic and he's just anything you want him to be. It's amazing to watch him go. And I, and the, the, the tourist, if you read the story is basically losing his mind the entire time. So I'm like, I needed an actor who could keep that energy up. And I just didn't think of anybody else but Heath. I thought, oh, and so the three of us, and then I cast other parts around, but they were the main actors. And then Laura Galt, who's a uh, producer for uh, her, she was a producer for The Outsiders, which just won the Tony, I think, on Broadway. So she was the wife. She played the wife. So uh, getting to have this connection with these kind of people in Central Texas is amazing. You know, their, accompl their accomplishments on their own is amazing. So getting to work Getting to turn Laura into a vampire was a lot of fun. I used watermelon and stuff for her to bite into. It was, it was wild, just old time sound effects. But um, that was such a blast working with that cast. And I remember um, I remember working with the three guys. We, we had done this long scene and I knew I had it. Like I knew, oh, we got it. We got it. But I was having so much fun. I was like, guys, let's do it again. Just we're going to go back and do it. Give me another take. Just because I was having so much fun sitting there listening to it. And I didn't knew, I knew I didn't need it. But I was like, oh, that was great. Let's hear it again. Let's do it again. So it was um, we just had that that kind of camaraderie, that kind of connection. And uh, I love that cast, the cast I worked with across the board on that one. Everybody brought their A game. I think everybody wanted to work on this project because it was a Stephen King story. And um, yeah, we just had so much fun with it. And when I listened to it, it I, I'm, I, I 
I like it. My father's proud. He listens to it all the time. And, and I'm like, dad, you don't have to listen to that thing again. And he's like, no, I like to listen to it. So he, um, he's proud he liked of the watermelon part. <laughs> yeah. But I'd probably just listen to him. This was funny too. Cause I, ha all my dad had to say is thanks. Keep the change. And he was so nervous on how to say it. And I'm like, he's like, should I say, keep the change? Should I keep the change? Should I, what if he doesn't want to keep the change? What if he's asking me all these questions? I'm like, dad, here, hand me this $10 bill and say the line. He's like, thanks, keep the change. And I got it, but it took like 10 takes for him to do it. But it was the funniest thing to, he was so excited being on the mic and uh, working in the studio. So having those little moments it, is, is what I remember uh, about that kind of recording. It was really the, the uh, Angela Bartis Peters is, She's a voice of um, Fawn, who she worked for Disney. And Fawn, I guess, is Tinkerbell's friend. So she was Fawn in all the video games in the uh, Disney productions. And she's in the production as uh, as the daughter of, of one of the leads and and has this you know, great scenes at the end with uh, with Ken Bradley. And I just loved every aspect of that, honestly. I, I loved getting to do it. I loved writing it. I loved recording it. Editing it was a hell of a lot of fun, bringing in the effects and stuff. Um, bring in the music. It was just a good time. I, I look, you know, out of the productions, triple six was a hard one to get through. One for the road was a breeze. I had a blast doing that one. And then parasite zero has been a lot of fun too, which is our new one coming out next year. But um, yeah, one for the road will always be a special one for me. Yeah. So what do you have coming up? Um, well, gun barrel highway drops as a novel. It's coming out as an ebook, a novel and an audio book. Um, read by Patricia Zamora, who's another great uh, San Antonio actress. And she's she's it's probably a four or five hour audio book. But uh, that's going to be amazing to have that release. I, I'm hearing the chapters she's putting together and they sound fantastic. So we'll release that. Um, then next year I've been working on it's Parasite Zero, which is kind of like Breaking Bad meets 28 Days Later. It's my nod to George Romero. And I'm a big George Romero out of Pittsburgh fan. He did. Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, The Night of the Living Dead, kind of those zombie movies. And this was my take on that world about um, a drug that infects this town and these people have to go in and it's uh, Mexican federales and U.S. Um, DEA agents. And it's a fun one. And it's about 50 voice actors on this one. And I was going to release it as an audio book, but it's become such a big production. I think we're going to release part one, which is like the first 10 chapters, which is like two and a half hours. We'll release that at the beginning of the year and then release the, the latter half towards the end, middle end of the year. Uh, so that's coming next year. Parasite Zero is an audiobook. I have a new novel that just got through my first editor, the manuscript called On the Bayou, which is a Louisiana thriller. Um, that's going to go through the editing process and I hope will be my second book from the Wild Rose Press out of New York. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm thinking about doing one of my scripts and trying to do a, a proof of concept with this wonderful producer I've met out of Spain. And we're going to do that here, maybe make an eight to 10 minute short film, whether it's a trailer or a proof of concept, like stitching some scenes together where that's early stages of putting this together for next year, but I'm going to try to do that. So I have to admit I, I've, I've, I've had this kind of burst of creative energy and I'm working on these different projects and I'm having such fun that uh, plus I'm working as a bartender and that's beaten me down, but in a good way. Um, in fact, like I said, this is my weekend. So I go back to work. Tomorrow's my Monday, even though it's Friday for everybody. For me, it's Monday at the bar. So <laughs> it'll be a well, long I think Friday. It's pretty cool that staying busy, you know, uh, and it shows that you're doing all these different things, right? You're not just yeah, one thing. Fun, and that's what's exciting. And, and it's all coming together and I'm doing it here. And I love that. And there's something about, um, you know, I live in a small town, but I work at a professional recording studio and I can connect with professional actors who are accomplished in their own right and their own achievements. It's amazing what they can do. And I love working with talented people. There is some kind of drive that I, I think part of this industry works for me because I know my strengths and weaknesses and I love working with people who are talented and, you know, that like, oh, I don't do that well, but I know somebody who does. Let's work with them on this project or let's bring them in on this. I love that aspect of, of creative work. It's really fun. 
So Sean, how do you guys do that when you're doing casting, like for a movie or a film or something like that? Do, do people just pop in your mind and say, oh, that one would be good for that character? Like Some do now. Yeah, I, I've, I have like, and I always wanted that. This was weird when we were talking about this. I wanted like a Mercury Theater kind of ensemble group of people that I would always want to work with. And I've started to, I've, I've amassed a group of actors that no matter what I do, like, okay, they're there. And so the first thing I tend to do is find the places where they fit in oh, like, oh ken can be that and patricia can be that and tony can be that and just put the actor heath can be that and um i'll work with casting directors there's a casting director out of san antonio named june june griffin garcia who's really great and she's like an ambassador to san antonio she knows everybody um so i'll go through her for local projects there's another casting director named beth sepko in austin who's amazing i've yet to work with her on a big project but i'd love to work with her on something uh, down the road uh, she's a huge uh, casting director. So yeah, going through the cast, going through a casting agent is the best way to do it. Um, sometimes I'll bring it, you know, I'll, my, pro, my audio projects tend to be a mix of professional actors and then I'll bring in family, friends, people that I'd love to do it. And I'm like, yeah, come down and do a voice. You can be an airline pilot or whatever I needed. I had a guy in uh, Canada of all places. I, I met um, at a conference in Chicago early this year and he just had a great voice. And I said, do you want to be an airline pilot? He said, yeah. And he, he was able to record it because with uh, a pilot, you kind of put this, you put a dub, they can do it. They don't have to be in the studio. I can. So he recorded all his lines at his studio in Canada and mailed them to me. And we're adding them into the, to the parasite zero part two. But yeah, I love finding ways to connect with different people and I'll be approached by actors or people that want to be a voice actor. And yeah, I, if I have a place for them, I can, I'll definitely bring them on board. Well, for all my listeners out there that have that question on how it works to get cast and all that into a movie and a film, certain certain casting directors, yeah, them. and and that's who I. If you're talking movies, it, 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 casting directors should be your best friends. Uh, extra work, I, I ended up working on a lot of Robert Rodriguez uh, movies. I actually got some screen time on Machete Kills and Sin City: A Dame to Kill For. I was a cop. I was also Powers Booth stand in on that one. So for a couple of years, I was doing extra work. I kept getting cast as a cop. I could play cop bingo with all the different versions of police officer I played, whether it was FBI agent or Texas Ranger or highway patrolman, or it's funny, yeah, different outfits. But um, that just by being there, being smart, being where they needed me to be, getting out of the way when they didn't need, need me to be. I mean, extra work is the bottom of the, of the barrel. But if you're good, People notice that and they will bring you back. And I went on one production and got on screen and and then they kept bringing me back for a number of, of different productions through Troublemaker Studios. So I've worked on, I worked on Alita Battle Angel. I was a, a motorball gambler. Uh, we can be, we were heroes, I think was a Netflix film he did for kids. I was the mayor of Austin, uh, his stand-in for that one. Mayor, uh, um, different things. So I would come and do different projects for them. And I'm always open to working for Troublemaker Studios. And it just became a thing because I was smart. And when I was there, you know, I was ready to, I was a private in the army, but I understood where I was. And, and I, I realized, okay, let me, let me make this work for me. And then they invited me back to the next one and the next one and the next one. I was That's a highway cool. patrolman from dust till dawn. I got my head cut off. That was amazing. Yeah, it was wild. <laughs> Got my head cut off. That was cool. It was cool. Yeah, it was really neat. When I saw me, I'm like, my head's gone. It was like, there I am. So it was wild. But I, I knew that was me. But it was still wild to see me. I'm like, that's me. Um, it's just and little things like that. It's just it's just fun. But yeah, um, if you want to get into voice acting, uh, it would be casting agents are your best friends, honestly, uh, in acting. Casting agents are the way to go. Awesome. Well, Sean, I asked you to give me one word to describe yourself and the word that you gave me was driven. Why yeah. that word? Uh, because I, I, especially this year, everything is, is um, I've always been driven to move forward, to keep going, to try new things. I, I don't shy away. Like I said, I, I've had failure, but I don't let it beat me. Um, I don't mind starting over again. Jeez, I've done that enough. Um, starting over, it doesn't scare me. Um, I've always been, I, I don't quit. I don't know if that's a positive trait or a personality flaw, to be honest with you. I don't know at this stage, but I will keep doing it. I won't, I will always keep trying. There's always a way. And that's, I find that fascinating that there's always a way to get things done. And I've, well, I've never accepted otherwise, honestly. 
Well, that's pretty cool. You know, you've taken me all over the place. You've taken me casting, directing, producing, screenwriting. We went all over. We it's really fun. Yeah, this that fun <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we didn't glitch out. We did a little bit there. So I'm glad we, we stayed connected. That's awesome. Right. Well, you just got to keep going. I don't give up either. I, I'm that kind of woman that just, hey, yeah, the warm homes can try and take me, but I'm not giving up. There you go. That's it's our way. little thriller, right? That's they the try to take to me out and I'm not, I'm not coming. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Sean, I also asked you what your favorite color was and you said blue. Why blue? Uh, I don't know. I've always, I tend to, I look at my clothing and it's blue. Uh, I like uh, my Jeep was a gunmetal gray, uh, blue, gray, that kind of thing. Green is also a color that I, I gravitate towards a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's just, I always think I always, when I get questions like that, I go, boom, what's my answer? You know, like top of your head and blue is the one that jumped out. I'm blue, blue, blue is my favorite color, but yeah, I like blue, <laughs> blue, 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 blues. <laughs> <laughs> I like good blue, blue works for me. That's a good one. You're the man with the head cut off, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> So Sean is a, I, I want to put a final call out for your book. So your book is dropping November 20th. Uh, put uh, any information, anybody can find it, where they can find uh, all of that good stuff. And if anybody uh, would like at, to right now, there's the pre-release link is at the wild rose press. You can look them up online. Um, or we can, I can give you the link. You can include that in whatever you need. Uh, that's what's out there now. And then um, you can also find information about me at audibleparade.com. That's my website uh, where some of the audio productions, you can listen to the, Triple Six or the Stephen King Project are even updates on on the book and then links and things that'll send you a different thing. But yeah, for the book right now, Wild Rose Press and it'll it'll launch officially uh, November twentieth is when it comes out. Awesome. So, is there a final message you'd like to leave for everybody out there that might want to become a screenwriter or producer, or director, any of that cool stuff? Uh, oh, you keep trying. I mean, honestly, the best way to be a writer is to read and write. Uh, it sounds basic, but it's the only way I know how to do it. And I don't know any shortcuts. I, I don't. I wish there were, but I've yet to find them. I just think you just keep at it. You learn from your mistakes. You you pick up the pieces of salvage and you try again. Um, and that's the only way I think I know how to do things. So yeah, you don't. And uh, also you're only in competition with yourself. You're not in competition with anybody else. And there's, I think once I understood that, that made life easier where I wasn't putting myself up against anybody else. It was just, it was my life and this is the pace I'm going. How am I doing? You know, so you're all, I think, that would be something I'd like to leave with people is that, you know, don't beat yourself up if you're not writing every day, nine to five, right? When you're inspired, write what you want and uh, just keep at it, keep going. And if you're, if you're driven, you'll keep, you'll get where you need to go. Well, there you go. There's that driven again, right? Let's yeah. just drive it. <laughs> Let's take you on an adventure. Let's spill some tea together. Well, I think it was really cool to have you and share your totally excited attitude. We didn't really get into the attitude, but I think a little bit during our conversation, you could tell a little bit of Sean. Oh, attitude. I'm sure it spilled out somewhere. Yes. <laughs> so it's gotta be, it came out of the tea glass somewhere. It's there. All over. Yeah. This is me. This, this is, this is me just how I am all the time. So yeah, lately, this is me. Well, I think, I think it's really cool and I and I really enjoyed our conversation and I too. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a really fun time. Check out that book, uh, Gun Barrel uh, Highway on November fourth. Uh yeah, thank you. Yeah, oh, it was really cool. And we, <laughs> we went down a lot of rabbit holes, and I like to go down rabbit holes and see. We Me too. This was a lot of fun. I hope I'm still I'm still on, but yeah. Oh, I hope I wanted to say goodbye, but this is really nice. I hope you can hear me. I had a great time. This was a great interview. Thank you so much for having me. T totally excited attitude. It's been awesome having you here. Uh, be sure to check out Sean Bridges uh, books, movies, films, thrillers, all that good stuff, and connect with him. Is what the website audioparade.com media here. Check out all of the cool stuff, and I. Back on the 21st with Sharon Hazel, and we'll be talking about teachers edc educ.ca education. And then on the 22nd, we have Meg and Kelly joining us. We'll be talking about the travels of terror, and then we're going to be jumping into uh, who do I have on Thursday? Thursday Grams is in the house, and she'll be talking about learning solutions. So we'll be talking about multiple different topics and we'll keep it running and we'll keep serving tea in a different way i could not do this without all of you guys as you some of you know miss liz is uh living in december so stay tuned and check out these tea times share these tea times with your loved ones uh and we'll keep serving tea until 
the teapot it overflows and will make a difference one cup of tea at a time so then take care and i'll see everybody Well, I think that's it. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> it glitched out right at the end, but at least we made it. That was cool. They try to take me out all the time. Like it's it's crazy. Um, oh, but it was good. But I, I, I could I heard your at your ent your exit, and it sounded good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. And again, live live streaming is it comes with its bloopers and it was a lot of fun anyway. I think we we had a great. I mean, it was our conversation that was awesome. It was great. I had a good time. That was a lot of yeah. fun. No, that was cool. So what's going to happen now, Sean? And within two.